And that's the reason why I'm consistent. When I talk about things that should happen in the marketplace, the, the primary function behind the accuracy is I'm only really focusing on specific times because those times are algorithmic. And if there is an algorithm, and this is this for a moment, let's just put it aside for a minute whether there is or isn't. I, I know there is, okay? Most of you know there is, but let's make the case for a discussion for the idea that maybe there isn't an algorithm, okay? If there isn't one, how is it that a trader can go in and trust that a setup will form, perform a specific function in price delivery that we can anticipate? It would be hard to do that. Like what rule-based ideas, apart from pattern trading, which I'm not a pattern trader. I don't look for price patterns. I look for inefficiencies and liquidity. That's it. That's all there is. And I look for that in time. Specific times of the day. There's very specific times of the day where you as a trader can say, I have to be able to control myself and not allow impulsiveness to come into the marketplace and draw me in to trades that would equate to overtrading which is a problem even for traders that can be profitable. And maybe you have done this. You, you can go in, you can find a trade or two and get profits, but then you want to do something else. Maybe because you see me tweet something, maybe you see other traders out there, other influencers, and you see them doing something. And you can't get the dopamine hit that you know that they're getting when they win, if they're even winning. You don't know if they're being honest with you. So you seek that hit, that feel good, that rail like on cocaine. Okay, you want to get a high. You can't treat the markets like a drug. You can't treat it like, you know, a bump of adrenaline. This is a business. You need to mind your business. And when you make money, the job is to keep the money. But ICT, listen, man, you don't understand. I had a trade. I was up 1200 bucks, and I, I allowed the market to scare me. out. I was looking at this guy on YouTube, and he said he was going to do this and do that. It scared me. I read one of your tweets, ICT, and it made me get out of the trade too early. And then I regretted it because it ended up making my profit target and even more. But I got out of it because you scared me with a tweet, or I saw something else that made me second-guess myself. Okay, what's the root cause of that? It's not me. It's not the other person. It's not the other YouTuber or influencer. It's you. You didn't trust your model. So if you don't trust your model and you're not following a, a rule-based idea and you take a trade off that could have paid your full profit or more, you can't worry about or more because if your targets have limit orders on it, how can you get upset that it went past it and went more? Why should you be upset about that? Your business model was you were taking a trade to that point. Your business model says you had a stop loss at this point, risking that much money. You were anticipating in the beginning, but now you're reacting to the influences of maybe something I've tweeted, a student of mine has done, other influencer, other trader, other YouTuber. You're not trading your trade anymore, is it? It's you reacting reacting to trades, reacting to price, reacting to other people's success or failures is a recipe for failure. You have to keep that stuff at a very small level of influence. And it's better really to not have it at all. I promise when you guys get to the point where you know what you're doing and you leave social media, you turn it off. Your trading is going to go through the roof. Your performance is going to be astounding. You're not going to care how you measure up to somebody else. And you're not going to worry about what they're doing, how bad they hurt themselves, or how much money they made, or what their payout is, or where they're at on the FTMO leaderboard. All those things are there to cause you to do more of what is likely to incur failure. The statistics are there. 90% of people fail doing this. So if you entice them 
to do it more frequently with larger leverage than they should, you can trade with 15 contracts with your funded account challenge. Well, guess what? That is a recipe for them to get another reset fee from you. And my son went through that. Oh, it's only a hundred and some dollars or whatever it is. I'll, I'll get it. And I'm going to prove dad wrong. Okay. Well done. You paid them. You made nothing. So he has to go back to square one. What's square one? Waiting for specific times of the day. So let's look at the, the London session. Now, as far as indices, I haven't talked too much about indices, but we'll, we'll be doing that. And I actually got some live sessions we'll do during the London hours. What's that? I got a call out of work. <laughs> I can't miss that, ICT. <laughs> there you go. Anticipation. You can't react to it. So London, by characteristic, um, what I'm referring to is in, we always refer to things in New York local time. So whatever the time is in New York, you need to have a clock set at your trading desk that is always showing you New York local time. I don't care where you live in the world. Everything algorithmically is running on New York time. I don't care who tells you otherwise. I, it, I don't care. Okay. This is the way it is. <laughs> Just submit to it. So when I talk about specific times of the day, it's always on the basis of New York. Okay. So uh, London time between two o'clock in the morning, New York local time to 5 a.m. New York local time. That's a three hour window. And the sweet spot is between two o'clock and four o'clock. So those two hours, but it can extend to 5 a.m. Generally, you're going to get some kind of false breakout. Okay. And that's not earth shattering. There's always been some idea of expectation of anticipating some false breakout in London. That's just the natural characteristic to it. What you need to be concerned about is where we are coming from on the hard time frame weekly and daily chart. If you're trading in London, if you're not referring to the weekly and daily for your setup, you're trading blind. You have to look at what that weekly, what, what's the importance of the weekly chart, Michael? Well, I talk about how you can anticipate, not react, anticipate where that weekly chart candle that's forming or that will form tomorrow when it starts on Sunday at 6 p.m. when all trading begins. Now we're starting a new weekly candle. So you want to anticipate the likelihood of that weekly candle expand, expanding up or expanding down. And you're looking for an inefficiency or stops that's most likely they're going to be the draw. It doesn't mean you're going to be right. Sometimes I get it wrong. It's okay. It, it, you're going to, especially with the climate right now, you know, we don't know what war is going to break out. We don't know if the bank's going to close over here. We don't know if, you know, the Fed's going to do that. There's so many things that are compounding the difficulty right now. And anybody that tells you it's easy, they're lying to you. They're just championing. They're getting lucky sessions at the time. And they're probably not showing you all the times that they're losing. But you have to factor in what that weekly chart is doing, likely to do. And that starts your bias, bullish or bearish. And on the daily chart, you have to confer with the previous day's range. Now, let's assume for a moment that the weekly chart, you think that there's going to be an expansion lower on whatever market you're trading. Now, this is both Forex and index futures and commodities. Okay, so it's not, when I, unless I say, here, here's another general rule of thumb. Unless you hear me say this only works for this, which is very, very, very rare. Everything I'm teaching you works on Forex and it works on futures, index futures and commodities. Okay. I, I don't know about crypto. I, I don't have any affinity for it. So I'm uh, just going to let you discover it for yourself if it works. Great. If it doesn't, I don't care. I don't care either way because I'm not going to be trading any of that. So London, you're going to look at the previous day's range. And let's assume that you're looking for lower prices. You think that that weekly candle is going to expand lower. And you want to look at yesterday's daily range. And it does not matter if yesterday's daily range is up, close, or down, close. There's more advantage 
if the candlestick from yesterday is up close because you you want to see a move that breaks below that yesterday's low. And once it does that, that lower quarter percent or lower third of that daily range, if you are in fact correct about your analysis and it's going to go lower based on the weekly chart, your sell setup is going to form in the lower quarter or lower third of the previous day's range. Now, by itself, that's not earth shattering, but I'm going to tell you something right now. If you chase price action and you always get burned, go back and look at your losing trades and you'll see that's exactly what you didn't see. So it has to refer back to a previous portion of the previous day's range. And this is not new. This is all in my core content. Um, I teach this in core content. But because there's so much content and you breeze through them too quick, like Netflix and chill, you're binge watching. And it's so much information. You have to watch these videos multiple times because you're going to you're not going to have an appreciation for what I'm talking about because you haven't encountered it yet in price. And then when you start looking at it conceptually and then looking for it in old moves, then it's impactful. Then it has much more meaning to you. And then you'll learn more about using it and how it will groom you into a better analyst. You can't be a good trader without becoming first a good analyst. And so many of you just want to be a rock star trader and not know how to read markets. And it never works. That never works. That's why you get these flash in the pan you know, winners, but you can't hold on to them. You're like a gunslinger that just picked up a gun for the first time. And you got lucky. You got lucky, and now when it comes time to do a duel with someone who has lived their life as a gunslinger, you get gunned down. And if you have the breath in you long enough to think about what you did, you'd be admitting, oh, I wasn't ready for this. <laughs> so in London, you're looking for false breakouts. okay? And you want to see – now, this is where you write stuff down, folks. You want to see some measure of a 15-minute or 5-minute relative equal highs inside of the range that would be in the lower third or one quarter of the previous day's range when you're bearish. Now, some of you are like, uh, why don't you just do this on a video? Can you just show me? Can you just listen? Because I'm explaining it to you. This is how you learn how to do it. You go into your charts looking for it. And when you find it and you do examples of logging that, and having dozens of them as examples, then it's more meaningful because you found them using these rules. Whereas if I just show you a chart, oh, okay, well, it doesn't mean anything to you. You didn't do any work to look for it. But when you see it and you study how it reacted in price after that, okay, we're anticipating that future reaction by price. We aren't reacting to price. We're anticipating price to do these specific things, which is what? If we're bearish in London, you want to look for a single high or a relatively equal, like equal highs, inside of the previous day's lower one-third or one-quarter part of the daily range of yesterday. Whatever the yesterday is. If it's a Monday, it's Friday's daily range. Otherwise, it's whatever the previous trading day is. That's pretty simple rules, right, folks? So in between 2 o'clock and 4 o'clock, we would anticipate a rally above those relative equal highs on a 5 or 15 minute chart, whichever one's easier for you to see. With, regardless, you'll see it. If you want to use a 15 minute chart as a bellwether, that I use that as mine. But you can look at it on a 5 minute basis. And as it rallies above that, what's going to be resting above those relative equal highs or single high? Buy stops. And the characteristic for the London session is to run up and entice traders to chase it going long. When in fact, it's a function of running into buy side liquidity for smart money to absorb those buy stops and be counterparty as they flood the market with buy orders. Shorts are entered by smart money there because it's a run on liquidity. It's engineered to provide a entry mechanism for smart money to go short. It takes a lot of confidence to take that type of trade because usually in London, the Judas swings are very violent and they're quick. And it feels like it's going to go up 100 pips. 
It's going to go up, you know, uh, 80 handles on the S&P. Look at this thing move, man. Wow, it's going up 12 handles. Look how fast it's moved. This thing's going to keep on going. If you feel that way, you're reacting to price. When we're looking for that to be a run real quick to get to those stops so that stops can't be pulled. And once that happens and the orders are not pulled by the traders that have those orders resting there, we anticipate price rejecting there and going lower. Now, if you can't take that type of trade or entry in the beginning, you, you, you won't. Let's just be fair. I say this all the time. Buying sell stops and selling short buy stops is one of the hardest things to do as a trader because at the time when it happens, it's fast, it's furious, and it's scary. And you have to know what you're looking for, which is why you have to anticipate and predict the future. You have to. Profitable trading is predicting the future, folks. I don't know why you want to argue with that, but that's what it is. Reacting to price. Okay, you reacted to what it did and you entered into a trade. Now what? You just let whatever the, the, the wind carry you in the, in the current without a rudder. You just, whatever happens, happens, man. You know, stuff's real random. If that's how trading really is, the hell with that. I'm never going to do it. I would never do that. Anybody in their right mind that would go into a venture like that, risking money, saying, well, you know, you just got to see what happens. <laughs> You know what that did for you when you started your demo trades, right? You get out there, let me just push the button on board. Let me see if I can make $5,000 in 10 minutes. And you lose. So you know that mentality, what it does for you. And it's not going to change with real money. Let me see what happens if I push the trade on. Boop, there it is. I got funded. I got through the, the portion of where we pass it. Now let me see if I can just make one of those real quick five-figure withdrawals because... You know, if I get one of them, that'll be enough to carry me through even knowing that I don't know how to trade and you wrestle with all that stuff because you're trying to do stuff that you're not prepared to do. You don't know how to anticipate. You're reacting, but you call it anticipation. You may share it with the community and me that you found a trade, but you're probably not being honest about what you felt the entire time you did it. It was just that one that panned out for you. So I'm not trying to encourage that type of thing in our community or in any of my students, you need to be 100% honest. And if you're struggling, find out what you're struggling on. But having a time-based approach helps you identify where your problem areas are. If you're not trying to trade at a very specific time of the day, how are you going to be able to measure your progress? How could I fix your issues for you if I was to sit down with you? I'm not, I'm not making this invitation for you, folks. I'm just saying, if you were, granted the opportunity to sit down with me one-on-one, -on -one, side by side, right next to each other and say, okay, I just hear some, here's my problem here. I'm doing this. I took a trade in London and you know, this, that, and the other thing. And then, then I saw this trade in New York and, and I was doing this and doing that. And then, you know, I made some money there and I was like, you know, I want to, I want to go into the afternoon session. I'm going to trade the last hour in S and P. And then I lost everything. You know, what am I doing wrong? You know, number one, you're over trading Two, you're not being a specialist. You have to be a specialist in terms of what market you're going to trade. And what time of day are you going to trade? See, in your mind, you're thinking, wow, I can trade the London session. I can trade the New York open session. I can trade the lunch hour when they run on stops. And then I could do the PM session. And I got the two silver bullets in the AM session, the PM session. Good grief. I can do this. And all of a sudden, you're on the you're top of the leaderboard of FTMO. And you're winning the Robins Cup. And you're blowing everybody else away on, on social media. And I get it. I know. That's what everybody wants to do. But you can't do that. You're learning all of this at your own pace. And some of you, if not all of you, are not providing the permission that you yourself require of yourself to take whatever time is necessary for you to learn how to do this.